the honor to present David Zasloff for Boston University's honorary degree. Oh. Hurry up, asshole! This event ends the minute after you write us a check! And it better not bounce or you're a dead mother- <laughs> Dear Lord, that's the loudest profanity I've ever heard! Hey there, everybody! I just wanted to let you know that this video is actually a follow-up to my previous video on Multiverse's roster, so if you haven't watched that one, please go check it out first, as some information in this video assumes you've seen the first one. In addition, I'll be responding to some points of contention from the first video before we start the roster section, so if you want to skip to just the roster section, I provided the timestamp on screen for you. However, I highly recommend watching through it, as it does provide some important context for later in the video. Wow, uh, you guys still really like that Multiverses video, huh? That's quite big. Not that I'm complaining. I had a blast making it, and it's some of my editor's finest work. When putting together the roster size, I feel like I kept the my lineup rather realistic, all things considered, at least for the alternate reality where they went with a more traditional development timeline, and I'm pretty satisfied with where the roster went. A healthy mix of live action and animated fighters, coming from movies, cartoons, live action shows, comics, video games, and book series, and a diverse lineup of character archetypes and playstyles. But today, we're throwing realism out the window, and we're just going nuts with it, because you can never dream too big. I'm here to ask the question, what if multiverses went ultimate? That's right, we're putting the pedal to the metal and filling out the roster to the size of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, or more appropriately, a little bit beyond. The movesets in multiverses are smaller and much less complex than Smash's, for comparison, the baseline character in Smash has 28 different moves, including their neutral attacks, aerials, grab and throws, special moves, final smash, floor, ledge, and get up attacks. A character in Multiverses has half that amount, and even then some of them have near identical aerial variants, so a generous amount for the baseline is 16. So how big are we going? We're hitting triple digits, 100 fighters. But like its inspiration, some of these characters will be similar to existing fighters. Echo fighters, or clones, if you will. Twelve of them, specifically, will be similar to another cast member. And when choosing my fighters, I'll admit I did take a look at some of the fighters you all requested. Though I quickly learned an important lesson. There is no way I can please everyone, or even represent everything that could be represented. I could have 200 slots and not be able to represent everything that one could say deserves the rep, so I had to pick and choose what series were high priority, and once those were represented, I could start grabbing more niche picks or double, triple dip on existing franchises. I wanted to maintain my rules from the first video, so if you haven't seen that yet, I suggest you watch that one first. TLDR, due to being a core trait of the existing game, I want to maintain the class system for what little it does represent. More on that later. As such, I want roughly equal amounts of each class outside of the hybrid class I introduced, since they're more complicated. And lastly, before we go over the roster, I'd like to address some points of contention from the previous video's comments section. First, the distinction between being a character and being a real-life celebrity, since so many people pointed out Kramer is a potentially controversial pick, which I cited as a reason for cutting LeBron. In Space Jam, LeBron James plays a version of himself. The same case is said for Eric Andre on The Eric Andre Show, or Jerry Seinfeld in Seinfeld. While they are exaggerated, they're still playing themselves. Michael Richards is playing a character. Kramer is not who he is in the same way that Maisie Williams isn't actually Arya Stark, and as a character, you can easily recast them with someone else for any reason. Even LeBron himself isn't played by his real-life counterpart. The issue is that the name of the real-life individual can carry a negative stigma should controversy arise. Basically, we're trying to avoid a Travis Scott in Fortnite situation from happening again. Second, except in very special cases, every character I'll be choosing must be from a Warner Brothers owned property. Just owning the distribution rights to a franchise, as they do for DVDs of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, is not enough of a qualification. And for my lineup, I'd like to maintain some connective tissue for the roster, so non-Warner Brothers IP, like Stranger Things or Breaking Bad, aren't eligible either. 
Not that Walter even has a ghost of a chance, because you can't put a drug dealer in the same game as Scooby-Doo and Steven Universe. Third, because this got brought up frequently in the comments of the previous video, I know the game is primarily balanced around 2v2 gameplay, which frankly, I think is an awful way to balance around. This also has an effect on the roster itself, with almost every franchise getting a second character. But I think that focusing on that limits the pool of franchises if we don't want to pick bottom of the barrel choices for some series. In addition, Series like Tom and Jerry and the Iron Giant already break this rule in the actual game anyway, so I don't think it's necessary to have every series need multiple fighters. Lastly, in tandem with my second point, a correction over who owns the Lord of the Rings IP. Technically, they are owned by Embracer Group, and it's highly likely that this is the reason Gandalf has yet to appear in the actual game. However, I must reiterate that the legal surroundings of this franchise, while complicated, do specify that video game adaptations of both the original Tolkien works as well as the Peter Jackson films are still held exclusively by Warner Brothers. Whether this qualifies for crossovers is unclear, but they've already done crossover appearances post-Embracer acquisition with Magic the Gathering Arena, so I'm treating something like this as a pseudo-Warner Brothers property. Basically, if they maintain some form of actual ownership over some aspect of the brand at large, or if they are involved as a co-production company, it's fair game. This qualifies co-productions with Legendary Pictures, any collaborative effort Warner Brothers makes with them I consider fair game as half ownership. This is as close as I'm willing to go to third-party fighters. So, with those out of the way, I'll be starting by bringing the 48 fighters from the previous video over from the base game and Seasons 1 through 3. The Seasons 4 and 5 lineups I presented as possibilities during my conclusion had some great ideas, I'd say, but are not necessarily going to be characters I'm for sure including. In addition, this lineup will start with a base roster size of 64, not including Echo Fighters, with four seasons of DLC of six characters each to bring the roster up to exactly 100. Aragorn, Green Lantern, K.O., Wily e. Coyote, and Pennywise will also remain as DLC characters. I'll bring them up during their respective seasons. Since we now have more room to work with, let's go ahead and also bring back four of our five cut characters. Stripe and Taz maintain their original classes, though I'd like to respec Black Adam into being a tank, as he already sort of feels like one, and Morty into being a support. Bruiser just doesn't fit him, and the tools he could utilize could be more of the inventions Rick specifically makes for him. Basically, dump the grenades and summoning Rick's ship. Our final change is that, upon further research, Dean and Sam from Supernatural are more similar than I originally anticipated, so Dean's going to function as Sam's Echo Fighter, or vice versa. Jumping off from that, I did want to quickly acknowledge that I think each class should be giving something to distinguish them, a uniting theme beyond what playstyle they're supposed to occupy, and considering one of my biggest issues with the game is the lack of defensive options, I propose that each class has a different way of dealing with that. Bruisers would have super armor on a decent amount of their attacks, and take reduced damage from all sources when using moves that have it. Assassins have extra invincibility framed on their dodges, and have the ability to cancel dodges into moves that aid in mobility. Tanks are given a gray health meter that needs to be depleted before you can actually damage them, and it replenishes over time slowly, but it can be paused by attacking them. Supports are given your traditional shield option, just like in Smash. Mages are given a perfect parry, launching fighters away to give them time to escape. Lastly, hybrids are on a case-by-case -case basis, though it's basically dependent on what form or stance they're currently in, gaining the respective ability of the class that form or stance most aligns to. I won't be going in as depth with the fighters as last time, just showing a few ideas on screen for each respective fighter and moving on to the next one. This video is going to be a long one, so I also won't be playing introductory clips since we have such a huge lineup to get through. Let's do this. Jon Snow. I'll admit, I'm not too terribly familiar with Game of Thrones, but I agree with those of you that said it's too big to not have a second fighter, and for my pick, I went with Jon Snow for a few reasons. The first is his slightly larger frame and build from Arya. If she's to Marth, Jon is to Ike, a slower sword fighter with more heft behind his strikes. 
Second, in his albino wolf pupper ghost, a precious boyo who could assist him with some attacks. And lastly, in my research, he has the ability to skin change with dire wolves, allowing him a potential puppet fighter kit with ghost. Not unlike Jimmy Neutron utilizes Goddard in Nick All-Stars 2. Daphne! I know people really want Scooby since we have Shaggy and Velma, but I'm gonna be completely honest. While I really love the character, he's part of one of those inseparable duos in my opinion. I'd rather have him be part of Shaggy's moveset, especially since Shaggy's kit doesn't really represent him well as a character. So in the alternate world where I'm director, Shaggy would actually be Shaggy and Scooby. So for our next Scooby pick, I actually decided to go with Daphne. Ever since we got the live action Scooby films, she's not just been a damsel in distress anymore, and I'd like to represent the new Daphne. Have her fight with quick striking martial arts. Maybe even have her use the axe she fought against the Black Knight with in the second film. Outside of Shaggy and Scooby, well, and Scrappy, Daphne's the most recurring member of the gang, and I think more people need to put respect on her name. Goro! Mortal Kombat, as the premier video game franchise WB owns, absolutely deserves more characters, and since we need a new tank, I think our best possible pick from the iconic lineup is Goro. This four-armed monster of a man can easily have his moveset basically ripped straight from his game. Walking forward with a wall of mighty blows, his spinning attack, leaping into the air and landing with a mighty quake, and a command grab that crushes foes between his beefy hands. Not to mention there would absolutely be an interaction between himself and Ben, who would compare him to forearms. Steve Urkel Alright, all of our current newcomers represent previously existing franchises, so let's get some new blood in on the action. With a roster as big as we have, we've got more than enough room for an extra joke character or two, and everyone's... favorite? Next door neighbor from Family Matters would make an excellent support character, using his uncanny ability to invent just about anything to create items to assist himself or allies. I mean, the guy's already crossed over with Scooby-Doo before, it's not like this would be any weirder. But when looking at my additions, even I find myself asking... Did I do that? Mordecai and Rigby I didn't have room for it last time around, but I agree, regular show absolutely needs to be represented. And while I absolutely could see both of them getting in on their own, I think the two of them are better together when looking at fighter potential. You could build them in a way that you could swap the leader and send the other out to take advantage of their unique sets of specials. Their normal attacks would obviously utilize Death Kwon Do and some of the equipment from their jobs, ham boning, driving a golf cart, and they could utilize the power to create items or for recovery purposes. Barney Rubble Let's show off a few Echo Fighters real quick. First up, Barney. While he's not the same height as Fred, he'd basically utilize the same tools for his kit. Bowling balls, flintstone flyer for recovery, a club for his melee attacks. Though unlike Fred, he doesn't have Dino, so he utilizes his son, Bam Bam, with his superhuman strength as a grab, quick pummel, then throw, which maybe he could follow up with a swing from a Stone Age golf club. He'd be faster than Fred, but not hit quite as hard. Trinity! Trinity would be able to utilize mostly the same skills as her beloved Neo. She can attack quickly with martial arts and hack opponents to disable their abilities, and utilize both firearms and bullet time, but she doesn't have the ability to telekinetically throw things or use a sword like Neo could, and she'd actually be a tad slower as her skills are less supernatural, though we can balance it out with a higher jump, and maybe she can use her famous bullet time kick as part of her up special. Supergirl! Kara may not have the bulk of her cousin, but she's just as strong. Her strikes deal less damage, but would deal more knockback when hitting with KO moves. She'd also take longer to freeze people with her breath, but has faster heat vision. And her command grab throws are more powerful at the cost of less range. Gwen Tennyson Unlike Smash, I don't require a character to be from the same series in order to echo or clone their kit, and Gwen is a fantastic example. Her abilities are near one-to-one -one with those of Raven. Healing abilities? Check. Energy manipulation? Check. Ability to levitate and catch objects? Yep. Portal creation? Mm-hmm. 
The only major differences are their stances when moving, as Raven floats, but Gwen does not. Gwen would also be slightly slower, and Gwen can't use Soul Self to take hits for allies. Instead, she gives them a temporary shield that's easier to break than the Soul Self, but doesn't damage Gwen. Saruman. Saruman joins the battle in an attempt to best Gandalf once more, echoing his adversary, though his magic has different attributes and he doesn't have Gwahir to ride for recovery, rather utilizing wind magic to try to create a small tornado like Heroes Up Special in Smash. His bolts of lightning are spaced out much farther from each other, his fireballs shoot at different angles, and rather than using a wave of water, he can summon an orc soldier to the stage as a temporary CPU ally. Lola Bunny. Since I brought back the other four cut characters from the original video, I'd at least like to maintain the playstyle of LeBron, as it's a really cool kit that no other platform fighter has ever attempted. But I maintain that we should keep people from real life out of the game, so let's just transplant his kit onto Lola Bunny. After all, let's be real, she's the most memorable part of Space Jam outside of the theme song, and maybe it's legacy in the form of Shut Up and Jam Gaiden. But yeah, she's an easy ad. Johnny Bravo! For this fighter, I was hesitant to include him due to the passage of time. A show like Johnny Bravo might cause some controversy nowadays, but the joke of Johnny Bravo was always that he gets his comeuppance for his behavior and it's never glorified or encouraged, so I think Johnny's an alright pick, though I'll admit his moveset is going to have to be a little plain. He is kind of just a regular, if really muscular guy. We know he practices karate and has spent time as a secret agent with Bond-esque gadgets, so we can definitely do something with that. Maybe he could even have an attack where he sprays hairspray on himself and it hurts foes behind him. Maybe throw a comb as a projectile, and some of his kill moves could be flexes. One thing's for sure though, his taunt has to be the monkey. Sister Knight. I really had a hard time picking out a fighter to represent Watchmen, but eventually settled on the protagonist of the HBO series due to her connection with Dr. Manhattan, who I considered but figured would have a hard time coming up with a moveset for him that wasn't too complicated or overpowered. She'd be fast, utilizing her mastery of martial arts with the surprising ability to use rosary beads as a grappling attack or temporary disable against enemy cooldowns or movement abilities, and of course she also utilizes guns as well. While it's a more niche part of the DC Universe, I wanted a Watchmen representative for reasons I'll explain later in the video. Freddy Krueger I'll admit that I underutilized horror in the original roster video. Only Pennywise was a mistake, and it's a mistake that I'd like to rectify by putting in one of horror's most iconic stars, Freddy Krueger. He'd be the ultimate trapper character, though he'd also be a bit faster than your average mage. He'd also have a special mechanic, where as you take more and more damage, the more powerful his specials become, symbolizing the fear you have when being stalked by a slasher. None of his specials would be a kill move, though. It would also be incredible to see characters like Rick and Morty or Shaggy react to having to fight a legendary monster like this. lion -O. Just having bulk isn't the only way to be a tank. lion -O isn't your traditional tank, but his kit is more than enough to allow him into this role. Wielding the Sword of Omens as his primary weapon in combat, he can utilize bolts of energy from the sword and even fly to recover, but his side and down specials are where his tankiness truly shines. His down special would be an acrobatic leap acting like a counter, and his side special would function like Winter Soldier's arm in Marvel vs. Capcom. He could advance forward using the claw shield to nullify projectiles and actually counter melee attacks, or he can stand in one spot and just hold it to shield his ally. We needed an 80s toy commercial hero in here, and lion -O made the perfect choice. Plus, he has crossed over with DC before, so this isn't any weirder than that. Gumball! For our last unique Cartoon Network series in the base game, I think we've covered all that's absolutely necessary for classic Cartoon Network, between Samurai Jack, the Powerpuff Girls, Ben 10, Dexter's Laboratory, and Johnny Bravo. And most of the big modern shows are covered, Adventure Time, Steven Universe, and Regular Show. But we're missing a rep from the amazing world of Gumball. I did consider Nicole over Gumball, but I think the power of meme potential is Gumball's true potential. His antics are more than easy enough to build a moveset around, and unlike Shaggy, he has canonically gone Super Saiyan before, so we can still include that in the game. 
and he can be a vessel to reference other nerdy stuff, like video games and movies. He'd be a fighter reliant on references to other fighters and pop culture. The Flash! Finishing off the primary Justice League members for base, we have Flash. He'd be by far the fastest fighter on the roster, and he would utilize the ultimate hit-and-run playstyle, though his raw damage on default attacks would be the lowest on the roster. Though does that really matter when your attacks are also the fastest? It'd take careful care with balancing to make him work, but he's a character who absolutely cannot be skipped now that we have the room. He'd also be able to equivocally teleport and use electrokinesis due to his extreme speed. Move over, Melee Fox. We have a new fastest plat fighter character. Tony Soprano! I definitely wanted another live-action television character, and fortunately, Warner Brothers happens to own one of the most successful and beloved television dramas that isn't Game of Thrones. I mean, they own that as well, but I digress. And for our representative, it has to be the man, the myth, the legend himself, Tony Soprano. Everyone's favorite gabagool addict has a pretty simple moveset to cover, but it's an archetype we can always use more of, a traditional grappler. Yeah, Tony would wield a gun that he grabbed after waking up this morning, and he could utilize other weapons, but he'd mostly be using grabs and his tough exterior, a requirement of any good mob boss, to deal with his opponents. He'd also be able to curb stomp enemies, and maybe even summon some goons to assist temporarily. Spies! Did you know that Mad Magazine was a publication of DC Comics, and was thus owned by Warner Brothers? While I'd love to knock in the face of that smug son of a mother Hubbard Alfred E. Newman, the most iconic part of the magazine had to be Spy vs. Spy. The white-suited spy and the black-suited spy would be like Pyra and Mithra in Smash mixed with bugs in this game, just with more violent tools, ranging from explosives and knives to military vehicles and missiles, wild animals, sports equipment, and more. They'd also have a light randomness aspect to them, with them having different equipment they can pull with their special moves, and both of them have a few unique tools that only one can use. You'd pick your starting spy on the character select screen, and when you get KO'd, you'd automatically switch to the other until they're KO'd, symbolizing that eternal rivalry. Sub-Zero Let's go ahead and get the rest of our Echo Fighters out of the way. First up is Sub-Zero, mirroring their dynamic in the original series as a clone of Scorpion, at least as far as his normal attacks go. Sub-Zero's special attacks are all completely different, however. He can create ice on the ground that himself or allies can slide on, shoot ice shards that freeze enemy fighters, or alternatively have a bleed effect, create icy statues of himself he can teleport to, all his usual tricks. With Scorpion on the roster, we had to grab his longest running rival. Sylvester and Tweety! Like with Gwen, our next Echo Fighter echoes a fighter from a completely different series, in this case, Tom and Jerry, as the dynamic of Sylvester and Tweety is extremely similar. The props would be different, but the slapstick between both of these iconic pairs of cat and prey are only matched by each other's antics. Heaven forbid you fight both duos at once, though. May God have mercy on your soul. Fiona! If Ben 10 was the flagship show of my generation of Cartoon Network, Adventure Time was the flagship of the next generation. And with a recent spin-off featuring an ideal candidate for an Echo Fighter, I figured why not include Fiona? She'd play pretty similarly to Finn, except she'd utilize a hammer instead of a sword for her attacks. She's also an adult, so she's taller and a bit slower than her original counterpart, but she hits significantly harder. I'd say she probably won't have Finn's gold mechanic either, relying exclusively on brute strength and determination to win the day. Buster! Or Babs. Bunny! This one's definitely a more traditional clone rather than an Echo Fighter, as I took the idea of this fighter directly as a young Link homage. Buster, or Babs if you'd prefer, you could make either one the face and the other an alt, would play like a weaker version of Bugs himself. After all, they're still in school for learning how to be funny like the original Looney Tunes, so they aren't quite as adept at their techniques, though as a trade-off, Buster or Babs would have shorter cooldowns on their attacks and be faster. Terry McGinnis The next Echo comes from a different time period than his original counterpart, but Terry McGinnis, aka the Batman Beyond, absolutely deserves to carry the moniker of the Caped Crusader, and he's here to prove that on the battlefield. 
he'd be a rare case of being even more difficult to master than his original counterpart. He's faster and has a better recovery, but his weaker attacks must be spaced properly to be used for full effect, and his technique is more advanced, utilizing claw strikes instead of punches, a buzzsaw belt buckle rather than batarangs, and he trades out smoke bombs for a flashbang that can unfortunately affect his allies and himself if not spaced correctly. But he also can fly with his suit rather than slow his fall. Which Batman would come out on top in a brawl here, I wonder. Harry Potter this video assumes you've seen the original, but just in case you didn't, I'm going to repeat my disclaimer in regards to the next few fighters. They hail from the divisive Wizarding World franchise. While I don't condone the beliefs of the franchise's creator, I do believe that the series carries several positive core messages, and we're just here to build a fun and interesting roster, and I think these characters would have unique and fun movesets, so we're including them. Our last Echo is Harry Potter. While Hermione was our first choice to represent the Wizarding World and fit much more naturally into the playstyle I wanted to represent this franchise's core battle system with, Harry does deserve a spot here. Naturally, he echoes Hermione, though without her study session stance change gimmick. His spell list for his normal attacks includes one from each of Hermione's styles, but as a trade-off for less versatility, he becomes a much more supportive ally and sports a full set of unique specials. Expelliarmus can knock foes back, he can wield the Sword of Gryffindor with a single powerful strike as his normal default attack, and apply his invisibility cloak to himself or allies. He would also utilize his Firebolt for recovery, and could send out a Golden Snitch which can block a single attack for an ally. But then it would go on cooldown. Hagrid! Bet you weren't expecting this one, were you? While I initially considered Snape or Malfoy so we could have a dark wizard on the roster, I liked the idea of using Hagrid since he's all about magical creatures, an idea I previously played with with Newt's commander, though Hagrid also has the build of a tank so we could get an extra for an underrepresented class. Yeah, he has a few moves that utilize his wand umbrella, including the ability to partially transfigure enemies into pigs, giving them a tail and nose to signify it, and thus making their movement and attack slower, but he'd also be able to let loose a Niffler to steal items from enemies, ride on Sirius's flying motorbike as a recovery move, set his former pet Norbert out to fly near and peck enemies with fire breath attacks, or assist an ally with recovery. But unlike his fellow Wizarding World characters, he can also utilize his raw muscle as well, throwing punches and kicks and throwing boulder-sized pumpkins. He could also have a move where he opens his umbrella and blocks projectiles. That said, if we don't get a PS1 Hagrid skin, is it even really worth it? Maxwell! Mortal Kombat isn't the only video game franchise fully owned by Warner Brothers, and the dissonance between tone of this title and MK is vast, yet we're having these two series cross over here, which would be genuinely hilarious. Hailing from the kid-friendly world of Scribblenauts, Maxwell and his magical notebook are here to make people happy by helping save the multiverse with his teammates by his side. An unconventional support character, Maxwell's normal attacks are simple, but his specials are where he gets crazy. By using his notebook, he can create items and weapons for his own use or allies, though similar to Robin's Levin Sword and Tomes and Smash, they break after a while. He can also summon creatures to ride on, grab enemies, or attack, but his craziest tool is his ability to add adjectives to either allies or enemies, such as giant, tiny, poisoned, light, heavy, etc. He selects his adjectives from a menu, a la Heroes menu in Smash. I think Maxwell would make a super creative and interesting kit that no one else could accomplish. I think Finn would also take a liking to him based on headgear and sword wielding capability. Legolas! Next up, everyone's favorite elf boy that isn't Link, hailing from Middle Earth, it's Legolas. He'd be a more sniper-esque character than the way I built Aragorn in the previous video, even though he technically utilizes a lot of similar equipment, he'd be playing the avoidance game as he'd be extremely light, but could have a mechanic where he can temporarily pin enemies down with a well-placed arrow shot. He'd have a few melee attacks with his sword, but he'd mostly rely on his bow, as well as calling in Gimli for MVC-esque assist attacks. Gimli would have multiple different attacks he could use. Emmet. Remember how I mentioned half ownership was just enough to get in? This is where that payoff comes from. Yes, Warner Brothers owns the characters from the Lego movie, even if they are made out of, well, Lego. 
and I really don't think that they would be against lending out Emmett for multiverses. He could utilize a few classic LEGO weapons, but his utility as a support is the fact that Emmett, as a master builder, can create walls, platforms, and even powerful single-use items for himself or his ally to use. Think of him like Steve, building walls, resource management, just maybe without some of the BS that the real deal can pull off. Plus, as a LEGO minifigure, you could easily swap in other master builders from the film as an infinite selection of alternate costumes. Wildstyle, LEGO Batman, Benny, the generic NBA players, Lincoln, LEGO Gandalf, LEGO Dumbledore, etc. Plus, that's just begging for funny interactions with other fighters like Harry, the DC characters Legolas. My only sadness is that LEGO Millhouse couldn't be here. So, that's the base roster. I think that with our additions from the original video, plus our newcomers here, we've created a lineup with great representation for the series we were able to include. We added comic book, video game, movie, cartoon, web series, and live action television characters, and we've kept a roughly equal number of each of the original five classes, encompassing a wide variety of playstyles and pulled in as many of the iconic faces of the company as possible thus far. I'll be finishing off our lineup with the DLC, but first, I have a confession to make. I've fooled you all. You fooled! I'm not just building a roster. I'm pitching a crazy alternate timeline version of the game as a whole. That's right. The roster, the assist characters, stages, announcer packs, even modes. Before I get to that though, I would really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button if you like what you're seeing. I really do hate to ask, but it really does help out the channel and it'll help keep it going for future roster builds and other exciting videos. Leaving a comment is also a great way to help us out. So that out of the way, let's talk story. The lore of multiverses is that a malevolent force known as the Nothing, potentially the character from the never-ending story, has begun to erase worlds from existence, along with everything and everyone from them. You can even see the potential power of this force when a fighter is close to the blast zones of the stages in multiplayer mode. Raindog's homeworld was destroyed by this force, and now it's begun to spread, consuming world after world. And that's all we know right now. But we can do something with this. Taking cues from Super Smash Bros. Brawl's Subspace Emissary mode, let's say Raindog managed to land in an unfamiliar world of your choice at the beginning of the story, either Gotham City or the Citadel of Ricks. Depending on which you choose, you'll recruit either the help of Batman or Rick, with them acting as your first character. I chose these two as both of them could realistically have access to tech used to travel to other dimensions. Both of these characters tend to prefer to work alone, but with the entire multiverse itself at stake, they choose to start recruiting a team of heroes, and even villains, from other worlds to prevent the ultimate annihilation of all that is. Your team of fighters will start by trying to find your first ally, either Superman or Morty. The team finds their respective ally, currently engaged in a battle with what is expected to be an invader from another world. For example, it could be the Powerpuff Girls battling Superman, or Neo fighting Morty. After defeating the threat, it'd be revealed that Superman or Morty was being corrupted by the Nothing and require you to battle them, recruiting both them and the fighter they were battling to your side. After the fight, Raindog would heal the corrupted fighter, but this would temporarily put him out of commission, and thus would begin a mode similar to MVC3's Heroes and Heralds mode. The lineup of stages would appear on the screen, and you'd select one, with two fighter silhouettes appearing, giving you insight into who would appear in 2v2 themed battles. After each fight, you'd be able to heal one of the corrupted fighters, while the other fighter escapes, and the next time you fight them, they'll be stronger, meaning you'll want to prioritize which fighters you prefer to have a higher chance at winning with more practice. Should you lose the battle though, one of your fighters will be corrupted and disappear from your lineup, though you can't lose your starting two characters. Occasionally, you'll also find an NPC trapped in what looks like some sort of pod in the background of a stage. Winning this battle will then add that character to a secondary list of people joining the resistance, assist fighters. Each assist fighter has two abilities, an active and a passive that they can utilize in battle, and they can be summoned when an assist meter is full. This will function similar to the same mechanic in Framemakers. 
Once you've reached the 100% mark on a stage and freed all corrupted fighters and saved all NPCs in a stage, a boss warning will appear over certain stages, and you'll be able to challenge a corrupted version of a much stronger foe. Defeating that boss will mark that area as completely freed from the influence of the nothing. So, what kind of bosses would you face? Vilgax The first of our lineup is the arch nemesis of Ben Tennyson, Vilgax. Corrupted by the power of the nothing, his desire to obtain the Omnitrix is at an all-time high, to use its power to corrupt all. Vilgax would be an imposing figure, despite only being a bit taller than Superman. He'd try to grapple you frequently, use his laser vision when he's far away, and also send drones and minions after you to fill the screen with projectiles. Shao Kahn Shao Kahn would be the most brutal boss of the bunch, hosting his disgustingly powerful kit from his tenure as a boss in the OG Mortal Kombat trilogy, such as his projectile, charging ram that covers the whole length of the screen, and air dash, as well as some of his moveset from the more modern titles where he's playable. You don't want to be on the receiving end of his heavily censored X-ray curb stomp and headbutt attack, taken directly from Mortal Kombat 9. Basilisk Thankfully, you're not fighting this one at its full strength. Prior to the battle, Fox the Phoenix will come in and blind it. The Basilisk mostly attacks using charges and tail whips, but if you get hit by its bite attack, you'll have a timer set on you before you lose a stock automatically. This boss would also be massive, but by taking the right precautions, you'll come out on top. Let's just be thankful Voldemort himself isn't here, because he's the kind of guy to spam the same spell over and over. Aku. Aku will be one of the largest bosses in the game, most of the time. He'll start the fight by throwing you through a portal in time, leading to a short horde fight with the daughters of Aku. After all of them have been defeated, he himself will appear, and he has three forms for the fight. I mean, he is the shape-shifting master of darkness after all. One is the form of a giant spider, which can create webs that will slow you down, as well as having bite and charge attacks. The second is a more humanoid form, like his famous 1v1 duel against Jack, where he'll attack with martial arts, and his last is his default form, being massive, attacking by trying to smash you and creating constructs like spikes and pools of darkness which debuff you. Lobo! The main man, the eternal bastich, intergalactic bounty hunter Lobo is here to take the heads of everyone who crosses his path. He's got a kit decked out with equipment, using his chain hook to pull you in if you're out of range, with a lot of nasty throwing attacks into the walls of his boss arena. He's also got a menagerie of explosives, a massive bowie knife, and he can even run you over on his rocket-powered motorcycle. While he's not a main bad guy, I think Lobo's such a fun character that he's worth choosing as a boss for the interactions alone. The Evil Masked Figure Lifted directly out of Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed, the evil masked figure doesn't fight you directly. Instead, you fight a mini-boss gauntlet of his monsters while he watches from the background. Captain Cutler's ghost, the Black Knight, the Skeleton Men, the Pterodactyl Ghost, and the Tar Monster can all appear, and you win after three of them have been taken out. The Pterodactyl Ghost uses swooping and claw attacks, Captain Cutler's Ghost fires his harpoon gun at you and can pull you towards him with chains on the end of those harpoons, the Black Knight duels you with his sword, the Skeleton Men throw bones in their heads at you, and the Tar Monster will grab and throw you, as well as creating constructs out of his tar. Mojo Jojo That is correct, it is I, Mojo Jojo, the most evil, vile, wicked, ignoble, dishonorable, mortally dubious villain that has ever lived. I am here to conquer the multiverse. I can't keep going with that. Mojo Jojo will appear, piloting one of his gigantic robots designed to destroy the Powerpuff Girls. Personally, I use the one from the 10th anniversary special, with it having eye lasers that sweep across the stage, firing missiles, and trying to crush the fighters on the stage. After his defeat, you'd see him getting ejected from the mech and blast off again like he's Team Rocket. Agent Smith. Hailing from the Matrix, Agent Smith has come to take Neo and anyone alongside him down. 
He'd be the fastest of the bosses, and would fight with his Desert Eagle by creating copies of himself to turn the battleground into a bullet hell, or by using martial arts techniques, as well as being completely immune to projectiles. He will always dodge them at the last second, mirroring Neo's special move of bullet time and slightly slowing down time for a moment. Daenerys Targaryen Daenerys would be one of the most fearsome bosses, because she'd only be vulnerable at specific points. She spends the battle mostly riding on the back of her personal mount, Drogon, and you'll be spending most of the battle actually dealing with her army, nameless soldiers fighting for House Targaryen. Once you've defeated a squadron, she'd fly in from the background for her attack phase, where Drogon will fly and breathe fire, occasionally landing to do a charging attack as well. And of course he'd have a bite attack. Think of the Rathalos fight from Smash Bros. It'd be very similar to that. Sauron! Another boss with a horde under his command, Sauron begins the battle with his physical form. Clad in nightmarish armor and wielding a mace, he strikes an intimidating presence. But eventually, he goes down, then spending the rest of the battle in the form of the Eye of Sauron, observing you dealing with his undead and orc minions. He'd be casting dark magic while you're dealing with the Horde in an attempt to stop you, raining down fire and lightning, creating thorny vines to grab or block off parts of the stage, or summoning an invincible Nazgul to attack for a brief period. At the end of the battle, you'll see the One Ring being dropped into the fires of Mount Doom, putting an end to him once and for all. BANG! Perhaps the simplest boss from a moveset design, don't let Bane fool you. He's a tank in the truest sense of the word, with a bevy of wrestling techniques, utilizing grapples and charges to get the better of you. Bane will self-buff three times throughout the fight, though he unfortunately loses some of his attacks as the fight goes on and he becomes more primal. What attacks remain will be much more deadly with each buff though, and he gets a bit faster each time, so you shouldn't take him lightly, or he might break your back. After freeing each area from the control of the Nothing and its minions, the fighters, now all free of its influence, have decided to take the fight directly to it. Having teamed up, Dexter, Rick, and Batman have created a device to take you to the Nothing's dimension. And I'll admit, I took a lot of this idea from the final level of Smash Bros. Brawl's Subspace Emissary, but it's just such a cool idea, and you know what they say, imitation is the sincerest form of plagiarism. I mean flattery. This dimension is a massive maze comprised of unnatural looking matter, but with bits and pieces of destroyed dimensions strewn about. Kinda like how in Kingdom Hearts, pieces of the Princess of Hearts world could be found at the end of the world, now corrupted. Same concept here, we could get some fun easter eggs for properties not represented on the playable roster. Pieces of the Kids Next Door Treehouse, the sign from Jellystone National Park, an area created from the remains of Dr. Evil's lair, the remains of a concert by Deathlock from Metalocalypse. Heck, parts of CN City from those classic bumpers, and you could even use this to tease some upcoming DLC characters. While navigating the maze, you'd end up fighting corrupted copies of each of the game's fighters, as well as a rematch with a corrupted version of each boss, before reaching the center of the maze to deal with the nothing itself, only to find a weakened mass of something on the floor of an endless void. A corrupted Dr. Manhattan, which will utilize admittedly weaker versions of his phenomenal powers, but still be the toughest boss in the game. After his defeat, he's freed of the Nothing's corruption, and with his reality-altering abilities, restores the multiverse to its true state before thanking the heroes and sending them home. After completion of the story, you'd unlock a boss rush mode, and a mode where you can play as Dr. Manhattan, uncorrupted, against a horde of real enemy players online, allowing you to be the boss for once. But you wouldn't be able to play as him in normal gameplay. Alright, before we jump into more of the complex stuff, let's talk stages. I'm not going to go too in-depth about my ideal stage layout, but I don't necessarily think every stage needs to be designed for competitive play. As long as at least 50% of them have competitive layouts, I think we're good. To address a few weird points from my previous video, I forgot to mention the stages I picked for the Gremlins and Tom and Jerry. I did this so that every series could have a stage, and then I completely blanked on the Iron Giant. Going forward, I don't think every series with a fighter needs a stage, but I'm maintaining the ones I had for Tom and Jerry and Gremlins because I like the concepts I came up with for them. The Cat Concerto is based on an incredibly iconic Tom and Jerry episode, and would have fighters fighting on the inside of a piano as it's being played, with the piano hammers moving up and down with certain parts of the music. 
Kingston Falls Movie Theater comes from Gremlins, and it would feature the fight going on as the movie in the screen, with the sides of the movie screen as the blast zones, and the foreground would feature Gremlins watching, laughing, and throwing popcorn at the stage. I'm maintaining all the stages from the previous video, and I came up with extra ones for some of the DLC characters, who in this continuity aren't actually DLC. So I'll go through the new ones now. Arkham Asylum is too iconic of a location to not include. While that means Batman gets two stages to represent its corner of the DC universe, it is basically the most beloved part of that universe, so I think that's alright. Likewise, the roof of the Daily Planet is Superman's home stage. I elected not to use the Fortress of Solitude, as I felt it would be similar in tone to the Batcave. Lastly for DC, I was tempted to go with Themyscira, but in that universe men aren't allowed on the island, so I ended up going with Atlantis instead. Perhaps Black Manta could be attacking and be a stage hazard. This next one's got some personal bias behind it, but I feel like Scooby-Doo is such a pillar of the DC library that a second stage is warranted, so I went with the Coolsonian Criminology Museum from Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed. I just really love that movie, and it gets cameos from a lot of iconic monster costumes in the background. Likewise, Ben 10 is such a huge series that a second stage makes total sense, and the Null Void is such an iconic recurring location that it makes perfect sense to represent the franchise as a whole. Azkaban is the iconic prison that holds dark witches and wizards in the Harry Potter franchise, and a stage set in the dark, desolate walls with the mentors patrolling in the background and maybe acting as a stage hazard would be very cool. The last series to get a second stage, Rick and Morty play such a heavy role in my story mode plot, and we'd already have the assets from it anyway, so the Citadel of Rick's makes perfect sense to include. It's also a notable recurring locale in its home series, and you could have some fun cameos, like the grizzled cop Morty and his Rick sidekick, Cronenberg versions of Rick and Morty, maybe even a summer or two. Next up, just as a fun throwback, because I actually quite like the layout of the stage, Townsville Rooftops would actually be a returning stage from Punch Time Explosion, just with updated visuals, new music, and replacing the old Mojo robot with the one in the story mode to save assets. The Boiler Room comes from A Nightmare on Elm Street and acts as Freddy's stage. It's such an iconic scene that I felt it needed to be acknowledged here. The home of the Thundercats, the New Cat's Lair, is a simple stage taking place in the courtyard. It'd be a fairly flat level. The Park represents Regular Show, and would feature trees with large branch platforms, as well as cameos from iconic characters like Pops, Benson, Muscle Man, High Five Ghost, and Skips. The Averna Social Club is a stage set inside the iconic club where many crazy scenes from The Sopranos took place. I literally only picked this stage so we could get a remix of the theme song from that show. Dexter's Laboratory is a no-brainer. It's got so many cool inventions that could act as platforms, hazards, and change the layout. However, Dee Dee has to be causing havoc in the background. The Winchester Brothers' home stage is Stull Cemetery, a locale that Supernatural fans will know quite well, and with the tombstones acting as platforms, the brothers' car in the background, and Lucifer's cage opening up halfway through the match to knock fighters into. Saturn is located in a desert populated by massive sandworms, which act naturally as a stage hazard. Of course, this stage is from Beetlejuice. Yeah, it's a Dune reference, but Dune doesn't own the concept of deserts and giant sandworms, so this is the stage to represent the ghost with the most. There's a few stages I elected to add despite not having a fighter. I thought that these locales and series needed at least some substantial representation. Repurposing assets from the story again, we have Dr. Evil's Lair. I wanted to include Austin Powers somewhere, but none of the characters I felt had moveset potential. Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends takes place inside the main hallway of the house itself, with some platforms. Some of the most iconic characters, like Eduardo, Wilt, Coco, Frankie, Harriman, Mac, and Blue would appear as cameos. The Inferno is a massive pirate ship set inside a cavern, and is the location where One-Eyed Willie's treasure was found in the Goonies, so the fight takes place on the ship's deck. Lastly, we have some stages to represent our quote-unquote third parties. Lord of the Rings and the Lego Movie. While I did include Hobbiton last time, I think a second stage for this huge series is more than welcome, and Mount Doom is the obvious choice, especially since we can repurpose assets yet again. Lastly, we have Cloud Cuckoo Land, one of the many worlds visited by our heroes in the Lego Movie, and naturally the stage is entirely made of Legos. It'd be one of the most colorful stages, and because it's made of Lego, the platform layouts would randomly change throughout the fight. 
Adding on to the 23 stages from the previous video, we have a base game total of 42. Items! Love him or hate him, a plat fighter just doesn't feel the same without the option for some silly fun by chucking objects at each other or battering each other silly with crazy weapons. Naturally, I think all the existing items should absolutely stay, but I had some ideas for some other crazy stuff. First up, add more food to the game to represent many different franchises. From Jawbreakers to Lembus Bread to Mr. Smoothies to Pudding Skin Singles, you could cram tons of fun easter eggs there. But outside of that, there'd be Acme Rocket Powered Roller Skates, which would increase your fighter's speed faster and faster, but they'd eventually be very difficult to control, turn, and when the rockets explode, they'd take damage. Acme Bumblebee Jars, when thrown, shatter and release a swarm of bees to relentlessly attack fighters like the Beehive in Smash. The Instant Martian creates a faithful guard dog who can attack fighters and even be stood on as a platform as he runs, but he can be KO'd. The Plumber Badge enhances the strength of your special moves while wearing it, but it can be knocked off and picked up again by someone else. The Thunder Stick is a single-use spear item that can either be thrown or used as a battering item, and causes an explosion at the tip when it hits either a fighter, wall, or ground. Captain Cold's Ice Gun will slow enemies affected with it as if hit by the ice status, turning everyone into May. Steppenwolf's Electro Axe is a heavy item that has a large wind-up on swing, but KOs all but the heaviest fighters at 60% or higher. Huntress's Crossbow fires small but fast-moving bolts that can be used even while moving. The Thanagarian Mace is a battering item that hits pretty hard but deals minimal knockback, and has a slightly longer swing speed than other battering items. The Temporal Grenade slows fighters in its range when it activates down as if they were hit by the timer item in Smash. Steven Universe's iconic Cheeseburger Backpack acts as a container, releasing a bevy of random items when thrown. The Laser Light Cannon will start charging up where it lands after being thrown, before releasing a Kamehameha-sized energy blast that deals incredible damage and knockback, but is very telegraphed. The Disc Grenade creates a temporary shield around whoever picks it up that does not leave a fighter stunned when broken. The One Ring grants movement, attack, and airspeed buffs, as well as knockback resistance when picked up, but slowly increases damage and turns friendly fire off in team battles for whoever picks it up. It cannot be thrown away or knocked out, and will KO the user at 300% damage automatically. It does get lost when they are KO'd. Kung Lao's hat acts as a saw blade when thrown, and will even circle the stage geometry for a short time like the hothead item in Smash. The Shokan Dagger is a simple, quick attacking melee weapon that can also be thrown, which delivers a bleed effect on whoever it hits, though it does not reset when hitting them again while active. Morpheus's Katana is a simple item, but let's be real, everyone loves katanas and I don't need to explain why or what it does. The Inferno Challenge Chicken Wings act like Smash's super spicy curry, creating an automatic storm of fire from the user's mouth for the duration. The Jar of Wildfire will create an explosion so powerful it can KO anyone almost instantly at 50% or higher, and ignites anyone who doesn't get KO'd in its range. It can even KO the person who threw it if they're too close. The Bludger can be thrown and it will seek to the nearest fighter automatically, then to the next, and next, and so on, until it disappears or KOs a fighter. Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Beans have multiple different effects based on the bean you get, ranging from attack buffs and debuffs, to giving all of your attacks status effect properties, to making you take damage immediately, and it's always random what you get. Scarab's Multi-Tool temporarily turns fighters who are nearby into little pixel creatures that cannot attack, just jump, and are very lightweight, but it affects everyone equally in its range. Lastly, the Candy Cane Shotgun does exactly what you would expect. It deals a massive chunk of damage at close range, but pitiful damage at long range, and it knocks both the user and the victim back substantially, though the victim is only affected by this at close range. And speaking of items, the Assist Capsule. 
Since they play such a pivotal role in the story mode, I'm sure you're wondering, what characters can join your side as an assist, and what do they do? Once summoned, an assist will move around the stage, performing their active ability and granting allied fighters a passive buff based on who you receive. I'll only be going over their active ability here though, and we're going to be going through these pretty fast. So, 3, 2, 1. Green Arrow will snipe at fighters with his arrows. He'd have regular ones, explosive ones with a bigger hitbox, and a fire one that employs an ignite debuff to foes it hits. Cyborg has both his laser cannon for shooting projectiles, as well as powerful shoulder attacks, which are great at killing. Gleek is an intentionally obscure pick intended to represent the golden age of superheroes. His flexible tail acts like Wonder Woman's lasso, either pulling enemies towards allies or grabbing enemies from falling off the stage, assisting with recovery. Michigan J. Frog will dance forward with his iconic Hello My Baby dance, with his kicks acting as attacks. Gossamer will chase after fighters and use a command grab, squeezing them for extra damage before they break free. Amethyst will attack by using both her whip if enemies are close enough, her spin dash like Sonic the Hedgehog if she needs to close the distance, but she can also occasionally shapeshift into a copy of a fighter on your team and run around attacking, similar to Ditto in Smash Ultimate. The Ice King will freeze the floor in some areas of the stage, and Gunter just kinda hangs around, but if an enemy gets close, he'll use his taser on them. Rook will use his proto-tool as a grappling hook to grapple towards enemies, then transform it into a staff to attack them. Scaramouche is your classic samurai archetype, attacking relentlessly with his sword. He also has a counter-attack. Muscle Man will throw barbells and dumbbells at enemy fighters, then drop a classic My Mom joke before he disappears. Nicole will relentlessly pursue fighters with blinding speed and attack with her claws and teeth. She will also fire off key blasts against fighters not an immediate distance that do great damage but no knockback. Grim will reap your mortal soul. He'll walk forward slowly and swing his scythe, instantly KOing fighters, but his attack is relatively slow. Courage will scream in terror, knocking enemy fighters away with massive knockback. Crumbopulous Michael will fire an antimatter rifle, which if it hits causes a massive explosion that can KO all fighters, allies included. The Tin Man will skip towards fighters before swinging his axe, which while relatively slow, deals massive knockback. Think Byleth's attacks with a mirror in Smash. Severus Snape has two attacks, Sectum Sempra, which will cause fighters to constantly take damage with a bleed debuff, and Crucio, which will stun fighters and deal a large amount of damage while making their attacks weakened for a short time. Kano attacks by flying towards fighters with his cannonball attack, attacking fighters at close range with a knife combo, and by shooting his eye laser at them. Neapolitan will utilize her semblance, overactive imagination, to create copies of herself that can attack, or create copies of the fighter who summoned her. If attacked, the clones will be instantly destroyed, but if you can't keep track of the original, you're in trouble. The Hex Girls serve a similar function to the Squid Sisters in Smash. They make the blast zones slowly get smaller and smaller as long as they're on screen. Sam, from Trick or Treat, drops candy as he walks around the stage. For allies, the candy heals damage slightly, but for enemies, it will damage them and give them a slowed down debuff. George Costanza has two abilities. He'll drop a delicious calzone on the stage, which heals a lot of damage, and he'll wind up with his bat, smug expression included, and send enemies flying. Jamie Lannister rides into battle on his mighty steed and stabs an opponent with his lance. He's one of the fastest assists and deals extra damage at the tip of his weapon. Castiel is the most dangerous assist of all, theoretically speaking, as with a snap of his fingers, he can instantly heal the ally who summoned him down to 0% damage, but he can only be summoned once per game. Captain Planet flies around the stage and attacks with punches, with different elemental variants providing different effects. Fire ignites them, ice slows them down, earth hits hardest, and air knocks them back further. Audrey II just sits in the same spot, but if someone, ally or enemy alike, gets close to him, he'll eat them and damage them for a short time before getting slightly bigger each time, locking more and more of the stage down. Austin Powers will first take a photograph of an enemy fighter, with the Flash stunning them, and then use a martial arts attack against them. Bingo, from the Banana Splits, has two functions. He'll either hit his drums to create shockwaves that knock fighters back, or, if you're unlucky, it'll be the Withered version from the recent horror film, running faster and attacking with his axe. He's much weaker than the Tin Man's axe, though. Snow Miser and Heat Miser will appear together, and actually end up fighting each other if they meet on the stage. Snow Miser attacks with his cane and applies a slow debuff to enemy fighters with ice. Heat Miser throws fireballs and can ignite fighters. 
Both of them also create hazardous ground wherever they walk, with Snow Miser creating slippery ice and Heat Miser leaving fire in his wake. Pivy will stand on the stage and create words that cause different effects to happen, applying to all fighters. For example, fast or slow will affect the speed of fighters, large and small will change the sizes of them, and so on. Rarely, Hibby can also appear in her battle-hardened design, where she will attack with her sword in addition to her normal effect. Mau Mau would dash forward with his sword, delivering a slash that would knock enemies into a stunned state on the ground for a moment. He would repeat this until he disappeared, in which he will then drop a random item near his allies like Rodan does in Smash. Gollum will move around, leaping towards the nearest enemy in range and attacking them as he clings to their face, slowing their movement and preventing them from attacking until he's shaken off, similar to the Metroid assist in Smash. Lastly, Unikitty creates an aura around her that heals allied fighters, an aura of positivity. But if she's attacked by enemies, she'll get very mad and chase them with biting and stabbing attacks with her horn. And with that, we have 34 base game assist characters. Next up, before we get to the DLC, we're actually going to cover, real quick, an aspect that's already in the official game, announcer packs. Basically, it just gives some extra characters a chance to shine in some form at least. As a result, while most of the playable cast will maintain having announcer packs, the ones I'll be adding will be characters with distinct voices from WB properties. I even wanted to include characters from series that didn't get anything playable or assist-wise, just to throw them at least a small bone. In the main game, Bimo and Lady Rainicorn are already options. As for the other characters I picked, we have Porky Pig, Foghorn Leghorn, Pinky and the Brain together as a one pack, Bane, specifically from the Harley Quinn animated series, which is naturally an homage to Tom Hardy's version of the character, Lex Luthor, Martian Manhunter, Fred Jones, Scooby Doo, Scrappy Doo, yeah, I actually like Scrappy Doo, Yogi Bear, The Great Gazoo, Space Ghost, Mandark, Fuzzy Lumpkins, Ice King, Benson, Peridot, Greg Universe, Ed, Ed, and Eddie together as one pack, Billy and Mandy as one pack, Haas Delgado, Number One, Mr. Meeseeks, Carl from Aqua Teen, The Monarch, Henchman 24, Roman Torchwick, George Costanza, Newman, The Mortal Kombat Announcer, The Scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz, Professor Dumbledore, Ron Weasley, and Luna Lovegood from The Wizarding World, Audrey II, Dr. Evil, Morpheus, Galadriel, Wildstyle, Wiz and Boomstick from Death Battle, and lastly, the narrator from Mythbusters, since they do own Discovery, and that was Discovery's only good show. Alright, finally gone through all the other good stuff, so let's close this out by finishing the roster. The game would have a full life cycle of DLC, four seasons, six characters each, closing out at a perfectly even 100 characters, and I kept to my goal of evening out character classes. Season 1. Yang! Even if you're not a big fan of Ruby, I guarantee you that you know someone who loves Yang specifically. And I mean, I get the appeal. Everyone loves a good lady who can hit like a truck. Don't take that out of context. Yang's actual attacks and such would be relatively straightforward, but what makes her special is her semblance, Burn. As she takes more and more damage, Yang can convert the kinetic energy of opponents' attacks against her into power, just like Black Panther's suit in the MCU, or more appropriately, Lucario in Smash. Yang would be a glass cannon that gets more and more dangerous the more damage you pump into her, meaning you'd want to take her out as quick as possible before every hit is launching you into the stratosphere. Marceline! I'll admit, I'm not the most well-versed in Adventure Time, but I know this character's popularity and I feel she's probably the natural choice for our next rep. As a vampire and something of a bard, Marceline fits perfectly as a support fighter. Her attacks would absorb essence from enemies, giving her a mild heal from time to time, especially when biting. She'd be able to play music with her base to buff allies, and she can transform into other creatures temporarily. She'd also have the ability to initiate a fear status in enemy fighters that make their attacks less effective, an effect shared by characters like Beetlejuice and Freddy Krueger. Immortan Joe! 
When selecting fighters for the previous roster, I made it known that I don't necessarily believe the main character has to be here first. This isn't following Smash's character selection process. And I'll be frank, Max Rakitansky isn't particularly interesting from a moveset perspective or visual one, but Immortan Joe from the beloved Mad Max Fury Road, that's a different story. He's this season's tank fighter, and wields his scepter and revolver in combat. His home base, the Citadel, would also be introduced alongside him as a new stage, featuring his monstrous vehicle in the background. Blue Beetle! I wanted to grab a newer face from DC, and thankfully, Blue Beetle gives me a good excuse to do just that. Jamie's suit gives him the ability to create plasma cannons, bladed projectiles, shoot cryonic energy, as well as manifest weapons and shields, and fly. He'd be a very projectile-heavy character, but wouldn't be any slouch in melee range either. Animaniacs! I've been very back and forth on how I wanted to utilize Yakko, Wacko, and Dot, but I finally landed on a character design that I think I like. I honestly considered using just one of them, but I don't think you can split up the Warner siblings, so I decided to make them another stance change character. Their basic moves are your classic Looney Tunes hijinks, just with slightly adjusted hit and hurt boxes and attack speeds. Dot's the fastest, most akin to an assassin, Yakko's in the middle, a bruiser, and Wacko's the slowest, being a very unconventional mage with the ability to eat to self-heal. It's the specials I wanted to highlight, with them morphing into their forms from the reboot's Studio Trigger-inspired anime parody, each having one unique special inspired by the anime their designs are inspired by, and their other three moves being dedicated to calling in one of the other siblings as an assist, just like Dag and Norb in Nick All-Stars 2, you can switch to the active assist at any time and begin playing as them immediately. At the end of the season, Aragorn would complete the lineup as the assassin of the season. Check out my previous video for an explanation of how he would work. Season 2 Dick Dastardly I'll be honest, you'd kind of have to make up a lot of devices and tools for Dick to be a character, but he's an iconic character to classic Hanna-Barbera, being an antagonist not just to wacky races, but to Scooby-Doo and Yogi Bear as well, amongst many others. And let's be real, this is probably the closest we're ever going to get to having Waluigi in Smash, so if I was granted the opportunity to direct this title, I wouldn't waste it. Get him in there. Black Hat I wanted to get some more love for modern CN here towards the end, and while this spot originally was going to go to Mau Mau, I'm sorry, Neon, Villainous is just the bigger IP here and represents an underrepresented part of WB Entertainment, web content. And hey, all things considered, Black Hat is a really cool character. He'd sort of be an inverse Willy Wonka, mainly fighting with his cane, but also utilizing his shape-shifting tools, and perhaps even be able to teleport through shadows cast by other fighters. He'd utilize inventions by his lackey Dr. Flug, and maybe could even call in Dementia or 505 for support attacks. Raiden! Mortal Kombat is such a big IP that it definitely deserves at least one more fighter, and Raiden is the obvious choice. Same song and dance as his fellow MK fighters, his moveset's right there. Lightning charge, shooting bolts, and I think his electric power should even apply a shock debuff to enemy fighters, causing light damage over time, speeding them up, but slowing the cooldowns of their attacks, making them even longer to recharge. Paul Atreides While I did say that Legendary Pictures was on the table, I do note that negotiations for that would be at the minimum somewhat trickier, so I laid off on this fighter until DLC. But Dune is such a big deal that I felt it was the obvious frontrunner for a collaborative rep. Paul fights primarily with his Chris knife, meaning his range isn't great, but his other tricks are what makes him deadly. Attacks with him will cause a debuff, be it bleed or poison, that sticks around for quite some time. He can utilize his Holtzman shield in order to protect himself from blows, and it'll work five times before needing to be recharged. As an extra backup, he can also see the future, so he has a counter similar to Shulk's vision in Smash. Deathstroke Ironically, Deathstroke can't be an assassin-style fighter, despite that being his actual profession. His melee attacks would utilize his swords and knives, but his specials are where he gets really tricky. I say, give him a weapon wheel for his side and neutral specials. He's the master of so many types of weapons, and it could create amazing versatility, but at the cost of only having so much ammunition for each weapon each stock. You run out, you aren't using it again until you respawn, so take those shots carefully. Vilgax Vilgax just barely made it here. 
I wanted to promote at least one boss into playable status, and I needed another Bruiser class. This narrowed my options down to either Lobo or Vilgax, and while I definitely like Lobo, I just think Vilgax embodies the archetype better. Plus, as I've said before, Ben 10 may as well have been the network mascot series, so I think it warrants having a bit more robust lineup than just Ben, Kevin, and Gwen as an Echo Fighter. Vilgax wouldn't be terribly complicated, he'd mostly be using punches and kicks, but he could also use his drones to set up on stage and manually command to fire, as well as his sword that can deflect energy projectiles or ignite foes. Season 3 Starting off the third season, we'd have Green Lantern and KO, as outlined in the original video. Don't be fooled though now, as we've got some crazy weird picks this season. Such as... BUDDY! Definitely not the first character you'd expect in a fighting game, but Will Ferrell's iconic role is one that I think could make an unironically great character here. His attacks would mostly utilize him dancing and having fun, and he'd have a hodgepodge of strange abilities that make him very weird to play, but cover a wide variety of options. He could create toys to let them roam the stage or use more static ones for attacks, give an enemy fighter a hug for a grapple, his enigmatic smile and holiday spirit could buff allies with the joy of Christmas, and he could have an attack where he drinks an entire liter of soda and lets out a massive burp, knocking foes away. I just think he'd be a funny little guy. Blake. You probably saw this coming. With Ruby and Weiss in the base roster, and Yang joining in an earlier pack, I have to complete the set. I mean, if I didn't, it'd be like having the Ninja Turtles in a game and not including all four, which would just be crazy! I digress. Even if I hadn't included Weiss and Yang, Blake's got a really cool kit that could make her very interesting in a plat fighter. Her weapon, Gamble Shroud, can act as a katana, sickle, cleaver, pistol, even a grappling hook. Combined with her semblance, Shadow, Blake would be a very hit-and-run fighter, sending in clones that could have different effects based on the dust they were made with, which depends on whether you're in the air or on the ground, and what special you use, and because the clones are independent, you can move after setting one up, making Blake a combo queen. Mojo Jojo I mean, he had to land somewhere after getting ejected from his robot in his boss fight, right? The Powerpuff Girls deserves at least one member of its rogues gallery, and let's be real, it kinda has to be Mojo Jojo, right? As the most recurring villain, as well as one with such an iconic and crazy personality, I think Mojo has exactly what it takes to be a fun character. He could be an interesting foil to Dexter as well, who in this game would fight in one of his mechs, with Mojo fighting on his own outside of a mech. He'd have a laser gun, of course, but he'd also be able to attack with his claws, kicks, and some of his inventions. But the other big reason? I'm giving him Diddy's banana peel, though his follow-ups aren't going to be quite as easy to do as the old ding-dong setup. Spear and Fang I wanted one more big fighter on the roster, and I wanted at least one more rep for Adult Swim, and like a match made in heaven, I could kill two birds with one stone here. As one of the more raw shows on the network, I think that Primal absolutely would fit perfectly in a fighting game. You'd have two modes, playing a spear on his own, or by hopping onto Fang's back, simultaneously at your most powerful, and your most vulnerable, as if Fang gets launched, she won't be coming back till your next stock, so you'll be stuck with a much more limited moveset if you get careless. Fang will only be around when she's summoned though, so you'll spend most of your time as just spear. It's a compromise for visual clarity in matches. Can't have four of her standing in the background at all times, it'd be too distracting and take up a lot of processing power. Season 4 Darkseid Our final season starts with the arrival of Darkseid, and naturally, all the powers that entails. Size manipulation, projectiles, teleportation, energy manipulation, and the ability to remove projectiles from play entirely, as well as rivaling Superman in strength. He'd be a high execution tank, as he has a lot of options, but like Ganondorf, he'd be relatively slow, but insanely powerful in the right hands. Ash Williams. We have plenty of horror monsters, but we don't have any horror heroes yet, and I've got to change that with the other biggest horror franchise WB has the rights to, The Evil Dead. Ash Williams comes packing raw action movie machismo, as well as a boomstick and chainsaw arm for just for good measure. 
Again, a deceptively simple moveset, but for a character who absolutely deserves to be here, if nothing else, so he can chat it up with Mr. Inc., the Winchester brothers, and menacingly threaten Pennywise and Freddy Krueger. Speaking of which, here's where Pennywise would go in the lineup. I imagine these two would be revealed together, maybe even released close to each other. Tom! In every crossover fighting game roster, you gotta have at least one obscure pick. And while I know Toonami itself isn't obscure, Tom, the host of the block, is a bit less well known. But why Tom? Well, he's the best excuse we have to actually reference anime and tokusatsu like Dragon Ball and Super Sentai. Tom doesn't really have a canonical power set, so he can do whatever we want. Key charge, shooting his blasters like Spike Spiegel, utilizing attacks with a beam katana emulating iconic anime characters. Tom can do all that without resorting to being a meme pick. Before our final pick, I'll note that this is where Wily would go. Hopefully with a callback to Coyote vs. Acme, which maybe in this universe where this game exists would actually have released. Fuck you, Zaslov. Team Ben. I know you all probably think I overdid it on Ben 10. GG, you're clearly biased, I hear you say. And to that I say, Ben Tennyson has had so much moveset potential that just having one version of him isn't enough. Don't believe me? They did the same thing in Punch Time Explosion, just in the inverse. A lot of people in the comments section mentioned that they'd like to see a composite Ben, featuring more of his aliens from later series. I maintain that the original lineup is the most iconic, but that doesn't mean I don't like any of the others. In fact, picking a lineup of five, each representing a different class, like I did with my original Ben kit, was tougher than expected. Eventually though, I did find a lineup I liked. Wrath represents the Bruiser class, the most obvious pick. Feedback is one of Ben's favorites, and has one of the slickest designs, and that kit would fit perfectly for a mage playstyle. Humongousaur likewise is a Ben staple, and is the ideal tank pick. My last two might be a bit controversial, but I think they're both worth including. Spider Monkey represents the Assassin, being one of his most agile aliens with some trapping abilities. And though it is an original 10 alien, Ben didn't get much use out of it until later series. Ghost Freak acts as the support alien, being able to initiate the fear status on fighters, grapple them with those creepy tentacles, and even phase through solid objects. I elected not to include his possession abilities, as that would probably end up feeling very cheap and unfun to fight against. Naturally, like the original, Teen Ben would utilize other aliens in his normals and recovery, such as Swampfire, Astrodactyl, and Crash Hopper, just to name a few. And that's it for the roster. Before I go though, I do want to address a few notable omissions and why I elected not to include them. First up, there's Ed, Ed, and Eddie. I know they had a really long run on the network, but I just couldn't think up enough moveset material for them, and in addition, I already have a significant amount of characters who are team fighters. Powerpuff Girls, Mordecai and Rigby, The Spies, Animaniacs, Shaggy having Scooby be part of his kit. I can't just squeeze a billion characters in just because they're part of a team. I'm sorry to anybody who wanted them, but they just didn't have the stuff to make it here. Cartoon Network already took up a huge part of this roster already, and they were even passed over in Punch Time Explosion because the creator didn't want them in, so we're respecting his wishes as well this way. Next up, we have the primary mech from Pacific Rim, another Legendary Pictures collaboration. In addition to wanting to keep the collaborative characters to a minimum due to potential rights issues, there's the fact that the official name of what fans have dubbed Lady Danger contains a slur against the Romani people, and until they officially adopt the term, I just don't think we can include it. It's a really cool design though, I'd love to have included it. Last up is a big one, a representative from the Barbie movie. While a massive hit for WB for sure, and a really fun movie in its own right, including Barbie would kinda go against the core messages of the film itself. Like, let's not kid ourselves, fun as they are, these big crossover fighters are a big look at all we've accomplished festival designed for self-gratification, and Barbie is a pretty staunchly anti-corporate film, among its other messages as well, so including her would be something I personally would not like to see to maintain the integrity of the film's message. I guess Ken would be weirdly appropriate, but I feel like this is one case of you need the main character first. There's also the fact that Warner Brothers just doesn't own the Barbie IP, Mattel does. I already made a slight exception for LEGO since they own the original characters of the IP, but I just don't feel like Mattel would be as willing to include Barbie in a fighting game. Phew. With all that out of the way, how did I do? Did I create the multiverses roster of your dreams, or is this the worst thing you've ever seen? Who would you include, or who would you swap out of my lineup? Are you excited for the future of the game when it returns? 
Maybe after the game releases, I'll come back and compare my lineups to the re-release lineup, or post-launch one year in, and see if I think they improved. But for now, I've got some other subjects I'd like to tackle. If you like what you saw here today, I'd be eternally grateful if you'd leave a like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications of every new upload, and keep the conversation going in the comments. And hey, I've got some other really great videos about Spongebob, Overwatch, Kingdom Hearts, and about games that really need remakes if you'd like to check those out. Not to toot my own horn, but I'm equally proud of each of them as well. And if you just can't get enough of my content and would like to directly support future content, my channel has been approved for YouTube memberships. Joining up will let you feature your name at the end of videos as a channel supporter. And if you'd like that, and only if you can afford it, we'd really appreciate it. That said, my name's been Gigi, the Nerd Incarnate, and I hope to see you in the next video, though, fair warning, this one might take a little longer than usual. I hope you have an incredible day. Peace out! By the way, here's who I'd replace the Ruby characters with because WB is about to yeet Rooster Teeth. Bye! That's all, folks! Well, I don't do my iconic victory dance for nothing. Okay, I guess just this once I can do it for nothing. Ew, ew, ew! Okay, I guess I can do one more for nothing. Ew, ew, ew! Okay, I guess I can do one more for nothing. Ew, ew, ew! Ew, ew, ew! Ew, ew, ew!